Hello and welcome back to a new video in the video series about multivariable calculus. This is part 13 and here we will talk about Schwarz's theorem. Indeed, there are a lot of other names for this theorem, therefore in general I would say this is the theorem that talks about the symmetry of second derivatives. However, before we start with the description of this statement, First, I want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. As a supporter, you are able to download PDF versions and quizzes for all the videos. Okay, then without further ado, let's talk about the topic of today, which I call Schwarz's Theorem. It tells us that the order in which you calculate the second derivatives does not matter under some mild assumptions. Therefore, let's formulate these assumptions. We start with a domain u for a function and this one should be an open set in Rn. So this means for each point in u, we find a neighborhood of this point that lies completely in u as well. Okay, and then we consider a function f that has u as its domain. So you know, for such functions, differentiability can be defined. Indeed, here we want that all the second order partial derivatives of f exist. Moreover, they should exist at all given points x tilde in u. So you see, we are not only interested in one point, but in a whole open set of points. This is important because we want to see all the second order partial derivatives again as functions from u into r. More precisely, we need that they form continuous functions from u into r. So you see, the continuity here is the important ingredient we need. Because then we can conclude that the order for the second order partial derivatives does not matter. More precisely, first applying dxj and then dxi is the same as first applying dxi and then dxj. And moreover, this property then holds no matter which point x tilde from u we choose. So it holds for all x tilde and for all indices i and j. So you see, this is a very important result because it tells us under these assumptions we don't have to calculate so many second order partial derivatives. And of course, by induction, you can also apply this fact to higher order partial derivatives. So in the end, this helps us whenever we need to calculate a lot of higher order partial derivatives. Now, an example of this important fact we have already seen in the last video. Therefore, here now I want to concentrate on the proof. The crucial part of the proof is that we use partial derivatives, which are essentially one-dimensional derivatives, where we can apply the normal mean value theorem. If you don't know it, you can check it out in my real analysis course, part 41. However, for the proof now here, I would suggest that we keep it simple, so let's consider the case that n is equal to 2. And then consequently, we assume that i is equal to 1 and j is equal to 2. Obviously, if we understand this case, we can also do the proof in the general case. Moreover, my last simplification here is that we consider the point x tilde as the origin. Indeed, this does not change anything, it just keeps our notation more compact. Okay, now about the general idea, we will apply the mean value theorem in two directions. Of course, the one is the x1 direction and the other one the x2 direction. This means in this case for the function f, the x1 variable is fixed and we can change the x2 variable. So in other words, we have a usual one-dimensional function with such a graph. And there you know, by the mean value theorem, each secant slope has a corresponding tangent slope. So we would say here we find an intermediate point, xi. And this one only corresponds to the second variable x2. And now the idea is that we can do this first in the x2 direction, then in the x1 direction, and then the other way around, and then we show that the order does not matter. And I can already tell you, in this last step, we will need the continuity of the two functions. Okay, now with this idea in mind, I can show you the correct trick we need to get the result. As already mentioned, we will approximate derivatives with secants, which means we consider difference quotients. 
So for example, we consider f at the positions h1, h2, minus f of h1, 0, and then we divide it by h1, and we will send h1 to 0. And then you know, this will be the partial derivative of f with respect to x1 at the position 0. And therefore, in the same sense, we will also do this with h2. Therefore, we subtract f of 0 h2 plus f at the origin. Okay, now at this point I can tell you we need a little trick to make the proof work. Indeed, the idea is simply to define a new function with two variables and we call it u. So you see, the function u is defined as the difference f of h1 h2 minus f of h1 0. In fact, for this function we will apply the ordinary mean value theorem. And this is possible because you see the second part here is also the function u. Namely, it's minus u evaluated at 0 h2. Hence, what we have is one part of a difference quotient for a function. And of course, the important part is we only have it in the first variable h1. So let's apply the ordinary mean value theorem to this one-dimensional function. This means that we have the distance h1 times the partial derivative of u with respect to h1. Or more correctly, we would write du dx1. And now we evaluate that at a given point, and you know we don't change h2 at all. However, for the first variable, we would put in an intermediate point we can call xi. And maybe it's a good thing to also give it an index 1. Okay, so this is our result after applying the mean value theorem in the x1 direction. So in the next step, we apply it to the x2 direction. Therefore, what we have to do is to reverse the substitution with the function u here. Of course, this is not so hard, we just have the partial derivative of f evaluated at two different points. So the first one is simply xi1, h2, and the second one will be xi1 and 0. So again, what we see is that we have one part of a difference quotient. So it's not a surprise at all that now we apply the mean value theorem in the h2 direction. Hence, this means now the variable h2 comes in front as well. And then we have the partial derivative of this function with respect to x2. Therefore, what we get is a second order derivative of f. However, here you should see this is the order where we first form the partial derivative with respect to x1 and then with respect to x2. Moreover, now the mean value theorem tells us that we also have an intermediate point here between 0 and h2. Therefore, this one we simply call xi2. Now, important for us is simply that we have these two points here and that they are smaller in the absolute value than h1 or h2 respectively. Therefore, with this, we know what happens to c1 and c2 when we send h1 and h2 to 0. More concretely, they will also tend to 0 then. Now, with this in mind, let's change the order of applying the mean value theorem here. This means, now we first want to see what happens when we apply the mean value theorem to the x2 direction. In order to do this, we have to consider our original four-part expression there, and now we exchange the middle part here. So this also means we don't define the same function u as before. Namely, we define a function v now. So the first part here, we simply call v of h1, h2. And then, similarly to before, we also see here we have the same function, but evaluated now at the position h1, 0. And also with a minus sign, so we have a difference again, and you see we have it in the second component now. Hence, now when we apply the mean value theorem, we get it in the second component. So we have h2 times the partial derivative of v with respect to x2 at the position h1, and then at an intermediate point between 0 and h2. So there we need a new name for this intermediate point, so let's call it eta2. So you see, all the ideas here are the same as before, which means now we reverse the substitution of v. 
So first here we have the partial derivative of f with respect to x2 at the position h1 eta2 minus the same partial derivative but now at the point 0 eta2. And then as before you see this is again one part of our difference quotient. Hence we simply apply the mean value theorem again. So what we get is the second order partial derivative of f, but now first with respect to x2 and then with respect to x1. So indeed you see a different order from before. And also we get a new intermediate point here we can call eta1. Okay, so you see this is very nice because we get a similar result as before. The only difference here is that we have different intermediate points. However, we know all the points exist and they all lie in a small interval. So in summary we can say the part from before is equal to the last part there. And now because the equation should hold for arbitrarily chosen h1 and h2, we know we can cancel them out and we get the equality for the second order derivatives here. And then you should see the only thing missing now is that we send the constants h1 and h2 to 0 because then the intermediate points also converge to zero. And exactly at this point you should recognize that we need the continuity of these two functions. Because then we can pull the limit inside and then we have this function evaluated at zero zero. Indeed we have both second order partial derivatives evaluated at zero zero. Which exactly means that the order of the partial derivatives here, x2 and then x1, or first x1 and then x2, does not matter at all. Now of course we have only shown that for the origin here, but you see the ideas for the proof can be translated to all the other points as well. So in other words, I would say the proof here is finished. Okay, now with this you now know Schwarz's theorem, which allows us to change the order for the partial derivatives here. Now this is an important result we will use in a lot of other videos later. Therefore I would say let's meet in the next video and have a nice day. Bye.